Hello! Uh, welcome to my live stream. This is for the second topic of GCSE Combined Science, um, which is inheritance, variation and evolution. So that's what I'm going to be covering today. Um, I'm also going to have another live stream on Friday and that's going to cover the final topic, which is ecology. So that'll have you all set for your GCSE biology exam, which is next Thursday, no, next Friday. Um, so hopefully you're going to find it really useful. Um, so I'm going to run through everything that's on this uh, topic. Um, it's a pretty long one. It's longer than the homeostasis topic and it's longer than the ecology one. Um, so you can see there's like 14 main parts to it. Um, and that's just for combined science. Then if you're studying uh, biology only or triple, um, then there's a further six topics for biology and triple. So it's a pretty chump chunky topic. Um, so I have got some little bits planned out for different parts, but I was gonna ask if you've got anything that you uh, really want me to cover, then let me know in the comments. Are there any specific parts that you think, ah, oh, that's pretty tricky. Um, I'll hold it up. Sometimes it's hard to remember what's in a topic. Um, maybe by having a look at this, you can spot some bits that you're not 100% on just yet, which is fine. You've still got, you know, over a week. So mm, it would be amazing if you were 100%, but I don't think anybody is at this point. Um, and a good thing to note is that there are no required practicals for this topic. Um, there's actually only two for combined science students in this paper. Um, and four for biology only students. So a lot less required practicals than paper one. Okay, so Alice, you said that you want to go over genetic engineering, which is this one. That's great, I'll start with that if that's, uh, that's the only request we've got at the moment. Anybody else that's just joined us, if you wanna, if, you, if there's anything you urgently want me to go over, just let me know in the comments and that's what I'll get started with. Okay, Alice, so genetic engineering. Let me flick to where I've written a bit about that. Okay, so it's a little bit of a chunky one. Um, there's two parts to it. The first is why do we do it? Um, and the re main reason is to create genetic crops or genetically modified crops. It can be shortened to GM crops. Um, and there's four big benefits of these types of crops that you need to know. Um, so the first is that they're gonna have improved resistance to uh, disease. Um, plants, they get diseases as well. It's not just humans and animals. Um, and they're also more resistant to insect attacks. So perhaps they're gonna have um, like thicker stems and leaves that it's harder for the insects to penetrate into when they try and eat them. The second benefit is that you're gonna get an increased yield. And yield just means that you're gonna have more um, product, whatever it is like tomatoes, or maybe you sell the whole tree, um, but you're gonna have more of it within the same space. So farmers get more out of one field um, than they would if they just had the normal crop. Then thirdly, uh, you're gonna have bigger and better fruits. So if it's a crop that makes fruits, then they're gonna be much better and you're gonna be able to sell them for more. And the fourth thing that's really good about GM crops is that they've got herbicide resistance. Now, herbicides are sprays um, that farmers use to try and kill uh, like weeds, unwanted things, um, but it won't kill your GM crop because you'll have put in a gene that means that it's immune or it survives um, having that spray put over it. So that's the why part. Um, and then we need to know how, how does this happen? So if you're studying foundation, um, you just need to know it quite simply. If you study it higher tier, um, there's a bit more detail to this process. So at the foundation level, all you need to know is that the gene that is the desired gene or the favorable gene, um, it's cut out from the genetic material of one organism. So I've just drawn a chromosome here to represent that. So it's removed and then it's inserted into the genetic information of another organism. And then that organism will then have the desirable characteristic. So if this was a gene for, I don't know, let's say blue eyes, you cut it out of one organism, you put it into the genetic material of another. When that organism develops, um, 
it'll have blue eyes. Okay, then if you're studying higher tier, there's more detail. So you need to know what the scissors actually are. Can you tell me in the comments, do you know what the scissors represent? That's if you're studying higher tier. If you're studying foundation, you don't need to know what these scissors represent. Any guesses? What do we think the scissors are? Not sure if there's a lag or if we're just not sure. <laughs> so I'll go through it. The scissors, um, those are enzymes. So enzymes are used to snip out the desired gene from the genetic material. The same enzymes are actually then used to get this. Now this is a plasmid and plasmids come from bacterial cells. So over here we've got a bacterial cell and we've got a plasmid. It's just extra chromosomal DNA. They also have a loop of DNA, which I will draw in, that's just sort of free floating around. Um, but the plasmid, that's this one, the plasmid is the extra DNA. So you take that out of the bacterial cell, enzymes are used to cut your plasmid open, and then the DNA is inserted into the plasmid, and then you just stick it right back in. And so now this bacterial cell, we call it a vector because it's carrying something new. Um, it now has the ability to produce whatever that gene is coding for. So the most common example you seem to get in science is insulin. So we would take the human insulin gene, we would insert it into a bacterial cell. This bacterial cell now has it. You need to screen and check that the bacterial cell has taken up the plasmid again. And then what you're going to do is make this bacterial cell reproduce hundreds and hundreds of times, thousands, millions, as many times as you can. Um, and all of its offspring will have the gene for insulin. And that's how we get loads and loads of human insulin. Hey, Ozzy, thank you for joining us. So um, that's the big bit about genetic engineering. The final bit is just thinking about the issues of it. Um, so the AQA specification says that you need to know uh, some of the issues around ethical, social, and economic issues. Um, so first of all, some people do, ha they have come up with some uh, problems about it. Most of these are, uh, what's the word, unsubstantiated. Um, they haven't got a lot of evidence behind them, but they, they are still, I guess, a concern that needs to be addressed. So we've got that some people think that GM crops could be a risk to human health. Uh, some people just don't like the idea of having um, something put into a, a food source that they were eat. So far, there's no evidence for that. Um, another concern is that modified genes could spread. So, for example, um, to check that it's been taken up uh, and to stop it from spreading, some GM crops are made infertile, so as well as the beneficial gene. An infer infertility gene would be put in it as well, but some people are worried that could spread to wild crops and then you'd lose the ability to reproduce your crops. So that's a concern. So far it hasn't happened and it's been managed, but it's a concern. And then the last one is comes up a few times with cloning and things, uh, is that we could potentially try and link this into making designer babies, which is just when you change the characteristics or you choose them uh, of your offspring. But again, so far that doesn't happen. Um, Sana, yeah, you're spot on. Restriction enzyme, that's really good and really specific. Um, for the AQA spec, you don't actually need to use the word restriction. Um, they save that for when you get to A level. But yeah, you could call it a restriction enzyme, that's spot on for the scissors. Okay, so that's everything on genetic engineering. Alice, let me know if that makes sense or if there's any part of it that you want me to go into more detail on. Okay, so for those of you that have joined us, let's go back and see if there are any topics in particular that you want me to go through. You can just write the number or let me know the name of it. So I will put a line through, where is it gone? Number 11, genetic engineering, we've covered that. And I'm seeing a request for uh, kidneys. Yeah, I can do the kidneys. Um, I actually covered that. Well, I'm not sure I did cover it. We didn't have a lot of biology only students.
but it was in my previous live stream. Uh, and then we've got a request for evolutionary trees. Yep, I will cover that as well. Maybe we'll start with that one, um, and then we can go on to the kidneys if everybody's happy with this topic. Um, because the kidneys, that comes up in homeostasis and response. Okay, evolutionary trees, these are used to show how closely related different species are. Um, they're pretty cool, I like them. If you like this sort of stuff, you should consider studying anthropology at university, you do a lot of things like this. Um, so this is roughly what an evolutionary tree looks like. Um, so you need to know how to interpret them and yeah, you could get some questions uh, from a diagram like this. Okay, so first of all, we've got species names across the top. I've just used letters, but it could say, for example, humans, orangutans, gibbons, tamarind monkeys, and then something maybe it's gone extinct. Uh, and then you have got your timeline along the sides, uh, and it tells you how many millions of years ago these different species came to be. Okay, so let's start off with a question. Can you look at this diagram and tell me which is the most closely related organism, or rather species, to species C? Which species is most closely related to species C? And why? How do you know what part of the diagram is telling you that? Yeah, Sana, you are spot on. It is a species D. And how did you get to that answer? Very good. So, Ozzy, you got it as well. And you said it's directly linked to D. And yeah, you can see that it has branched most recently. And that's really what you want to say. Um, so now let's talk about what the branches mean. So where the branches sort of split, that one goes to C and this one goes to D. At that point, that is your last common ancestor. And basically, that means it's, an, it's a species that both of these new species came from. And if you study biology only or triple, um, you'll have learned about speciation. So I'm just going to label that on the diagram so you can see it. Last common ancestor. Okay, so using what we've learned about that, I've got another question for you. When was the last common ancestor of A and C? When was the last common ancestor of A and C? Sorry I didn't use a ruler for my lines, and <laughs> they're not very clear. Okay, we've got some answers. So the question was, when was the last common ancestor? And we had to read down from A and down from C until the lines join up. And Sana, you're spot on, it's 2.5. So we're looking for when the lines join together. Boop, 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 that's no good. Boop, 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 no good. We go across. And this is where A and C split off from each other. So you could just look at this bit here, really. You read across, halfway between two and three, it's 2.5. <laughs> Don't worry, Ozzy, I'm sure you just didn't hear me exactly. Okay, very good. Um, and then, okay, last question for you. Which organism is extinct, or which species is extinct, and when did it go extinct? Which species is now extinct and when did it go extinct? Good, we've got half of an answer. So, which species is extinct and when did it go extinct? Hopefully you can see this. I know I'm probably moving it around just a little bit. Should probably learn how to use uh, an encoder, and then I could show you my screen and do some fancy stuff, but I think that's quite hard to do. Okay, so Sana, you got E, that's correct. E has gone extinct because you can see that the line has stopped, so it means it's, it's not alive. If it was alive, then it would be zero million years ago, 
because it's still alive, so it's it's not stopped. And then all you do is you read across from that line, it's actually going to be the same as the previous answer, and it's 2.5 million years ago. So that is when species E went extinct. Okay, so uh, we've got a question. Alice says, does this link to pyramids of biomass? Um, no, this doesn't link to pyramids of biomass. It is another diagram, and one of those questions you're going to get that uses a diagram. Uh, but no, this won't come up with regards to that. Okie dokie. Um, so before we go on to, I think it was, was it Aussie's request for, for Osmo regulation? Uh, or the kidneys, yeah. Uh, before we just go on to that for Aussie, if you're still with us, um, let's just check. Is there anything else anybody would like to go through on this list? Yep, Sana, I can definitely go through antibiotic resistance. And then we also want some protein synthesis for Ellie. Yep, that comes up on the triple only, which is on the other side. So, yep, I'll definitely go up, go over that for you. Okay, okay, and then let me just cross off uh, the fact that we have just gone through evolutionary trees. Okay, so we'll start with antibiotic resistance and then protein synthesis. So antibiotic resistance, um, you need to know what it is and how it happens. I've kind of left that blank because I want to know what you already know. So can you tell me what is antibiotic resistance and how does it happen? Then we're going to look at how we can prevent this. And I've given you a couple of pictures to try and jog your memory. So while you're telling me what it is, I'm going to start writing my answer and let's see if they match up. Have we got any answers? I think it perhaps the lag's a bit worse today. Sorry about that. No answers. <laughs> Oh, great, we have got some answers. Okay, let me just finish up and then I'm gonna check your answers and we'll see if they match. Okay. So, Forming a gene for antibiotic resistance becomes more common in the population and the antibiotic resistance strains resist certain types of bacteria. I think you just meant to say certain type of antibiotic for your last one. Um, so that's really good. And Ellie, you said a mutation that causes there to be a resistant strain of bacteria. Correct, very good. So you both got the fact that there needs to be a mutation, which is great. And a mutation is just a change uh, to the genetic information or DNA of an organism. Um, so very simply, antibiotics are drugs that normally kill bacteria. But when you've got antibiotic resistance, then it doesn't kill the bacteria anymore. It arises when um, a mutated bacteria has got a gene that will give it resistance to that antibiotic. So when the antibiotic is used, it doesn't get killed. The rest of the population does, and it then will be alive to replicate. Um, you've probably learned for paper one that bacteria use asexual reproduction to replicate. Although that comes up in paper two as well. Yeah. Hopefully you know that. So it then spreads the uh, antibiotic resistance by replicating so that all of the offspring have got this resistance. Um, so yeah, Hader, you're right. 
does it not resist the effects of medication? Yeah, it will, specifically one type of antibiotic. So if you get an infection and you unfortunately have a type of bacteria that is resistant to antibiotic, a specific antibiotic, your doctor is going to have to try and find a different antibiotic that will kill it. So we, we are ha facing this problem. It's happening more and more um, because antibiotics are being overused or not used correctly. So there are three ways that we have to try and prevent this from happening in future. See if you can tell me what each of these three little pictures represent as methods to prevent antibiotic resistance. And Sana, you're spot on. MRSA is your example that you need to know. Um, MRSA, it's sometimes called a super bug. Um, and yeah, it's resistant. It actually stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is the name of the bacterium. And then methicillin is the name of the antibiotic. So yeah, that's what it's resistant to. Okay, so what do each of these pictures stand for or represent in the prevention of antibiotic resistance? Okay, Ellie, you're spot on for the first one. Doctors need to prescribe antibiotics less and they only need to prescribe them when a person actually needs them, i.e. they're very ill, they're not just gonna get better on their own and that it's actually caused by a bacteria uh, species. Sometimes people go to their GP and they ask for antibiotics and they've actually got a viral infection and antibiotics they don't work on viruses. That came up in the infection response topic so hopefully you know that. So doctors shouldn't be using them if you've got a viral infection. So that's number one. Number two, very good Oscar and Ellie you both got that, is finishing your full course of antibiotics. Even if you start to feel better halfway through the course you still need to finish it because not all of the bacteria may be killed by that point. So you've got to keep going, keep taking it. And then what do we think number three is? What's this little badly drawn chicken <laughs> meant to represent? Any ideas? Well, uh, yep. Sana, that's exactly what it's um, representing. And if we want to prevent the spread of antibiotics, we need to actually stop using antibiotics in agriculture. So at the moment, it's very much overused. A lot of farm animals will be given antibiotics as a preventative measure to stop them ever getting ill, when instead it's meant to be used once the animal's already sick. Then you give it antibiotics to try and help cure it from its illness, but uh, at the moment it's just been given like food, you know, they're just being given it all the time. So this is particularly happening in, for example, America, um, but in the UK it's sort of been restricted a bit and we need to continue with that and restrict it further. <clears throat> well, you said, can they be passed along within the food chain to humans? Um, I'm not, that's a good question. I'm not sure, let me think about it. Antibiotics don't stay in your system very long and they're working to kill the bacteria. So they're probably got a pretty short lifespan. That's why if you ever get an infection, you'll, you'll often take them like up to four times a day, your pills. That's because they're, they're not gonna hang around for long. So it's really unlikely that they're gonna make it all the way um, to us when, when we, if we eat meat. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, you know, something that some people would care about and look at when you buy your meat, um, if it's had antibiotics. Okay, so that is antibiotic resistance. Sana, does that cover it? Is there anything else you'd like to know about it? Let me know. Um, and then at the moment, we've got a request for uh, kidneys, which is actually in the previous topic. So I will just go over it. Uh, at the end. And we've also got a request for protein synthesis. Yeah, you're welcome, Sana. I'm glad you've got it. Okay, so protein synthesis um, and this sort of overview of the extra bits for biology that comes up under DNA structure. And Alice, you also want to do speciation. Yep, we can do that.
Okay, so let's start with protein synthesis. So this is, um, before the new specification, this was only taught for A-level biology. So it's really been dropped down um, to make it a bit harder for you guys. I really like protein synthesis as a topic because it's pretty visual and uh, I don't know, I feel like if you practice it a few times, you can get it in your heads. So I guess the first thing, we'll look at uh, DNA structure because you have to understand it to understand protein synthesis. Um, people doing combined science only, you do need to know a tiny bit about DNA structure, but biology only students, you need to know a lot more. So it's double stranded, so we call it a polymer, and it forms a shape which is a double helix. If you're doing biology only, you need to know what uh, these things are going across the DNA and the letters that represent them. So these are called bases. Can anybody tell me the names of the four bases? Hopefully you can spot, we've got four different shapes here. Purple with a point, purple curved, pink with a sort of reverse point and pink curved. So A, T, C and G, very good. And you've, you've actually got them matched up, good. So you'll notice that um, each base has a pair that it can join to and it can only join to that pair. So A joins to T, and G joins to C. And I have a silly way of remembering that, I'm sure you probably do as well, but it's at the golf club. I have a brother that loves golf, and he came up with it and he told me, and that's how I remember it now, at the golf club. I don't know. Anyway, so these bases join together. Um, and then you need to know more detail about structure of DNA. So you have got a phosphate group that is joined to a sugar that is joined to a base. Okay, so this is our phosphate group. It's drawn just with a little circle. This is our sugar, the pentagon. And then we've got our base, and this could be any one of these four. Basis. So we give this whole thing a name. Does anybody know the name of all of this together? Let me just fill it in what I've done. P for phosphate. This is a sugar. And this is a base. Um, it's not a codon, Sana. Very good, Alice. It is a nucleotide. Okay, so the whole structure of DNA is just made up of these nucleotides repeating again and again and again. The sugar and the phosphate, they make up the backbone of the DNA. So this, both strands are just sugar and phosphate. And then the bases join up across the middle. So that's our structure of DNA. Now we're gonna look at how they work for making proteins. So three bases together will code for one amino acid and from your digestion topic uh, you'll probably know that proteins break down into amino acids so it makes sense that amino acids build up to give you proteins and yeah Alice that's absolutely right the pairing up of A to T and G to C is called complementary base pairing yep that's really good okay so uh, I am going to just get my spec up alongside me talking because I have taught this at A level and I might, if I don't look at the GCSE one, I might give you too much of the A level detail that you don't need to know. Your teachers might have done this as well. So it's pretty easy to do to give you more information rather than less, but uh, we'll try and keep it simple. Okie dokie. So you don't need to know mRNA or tRNA. All right, so we'll try and keep it at that level then. Uh, let me just skip forward. Uh, sorry, bear with me, bear with me. Okay. All right, so let's keep it symbol. AQA says all you need to know is that there are three amino acids, sorry, 
Three, uh, bases will code for one amino acid. So you've probably seen diagrams that look something like this. I'm just drawing it right now. Something like this, where your three bases are equal to one amino acid. Now, you've also got mentioned um, ribosomes. So you've learned in topic one that ribosomes are where protein synthesis happens. And so what needs to happen is that the bases, they need to be brought over to the ribosome by a carrier molecule. If you do A-level, you'll learn that this is called tRNA, and you'll look at tRNA in a lot more detail. But for GCSE, you just need to know that there is a carrier molecule that brings them over to the ribosome. Ribosomes are pretty huge, but I'm just gonna draw it pretty small. So you could think of the carrier molecule as like a little shuttle bringing it from the DNA to the ribosome in the cell. Okay, when it gets there, all it's going to do is cause it to create um, uh, an amino acid. Now, lots of amino acids will then build up together. So you'll have loads of these in a big long chain. So let me draw another one beside it. And what you can imagine is that this goes on for a long, long time. It could be up to, you know, hundreds or even thousands of these. So here's another section of three bases that have been carried over by your carrier molecule to the ribosome. And they're going to then cause there to be another amino acid. Now, this will be a different amino acid if it's a different sequence of those three bases. So if the first one was TAG and the second one was CAT, then we're going to have a different amino acid. And as you get different amino acids lining up beside each other, they join together. They form a bond between them. And you'll end up with a huge big chain of amino acids forming bonds between them. This will then detach from your bases and it will then fold. So proteins have a very specific shape and it's the specific shape that allows them to carry out their function. So you have different kinds of proteins. Um, some of them are structural proteins, um, like collagen, that's used in the body for support. Um, lots of different ones, cellulose is used in plants for support. So they need to be folded up in a very specific way. If you have a mutation in your DNA and the mutation causes there to be a different base, that will change and make a different amino acids and then when the protein tries to form by folding up the amino acid chain, then it actually forms the wrong shape. And it means that it's not going to function correctly. So if it's a structural protein, it means it might not be as strong anymore because it doesn't fold in the right way. So that's kind of the overview of uh, protein synthesis. Let me just double check on the spec if there's anything else you need to know along there. So. I've covered how a change in the DNA structure results in a change in protein synthesized by a gene. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, this is important to mention, and this is needed on the combined science paper as well. So mutations are happening continuously in our bodies, um, and our, our cells are really good at repairing mutations, but the good news is, is that most mutations, they actually don't affect the final protein that's made from the gene. And this is because um, amino acids, the same amino acid can often be coded for by multiple um, triplets of bases. So it means that even if one of your bases gets changed on the DNA, it will still code for the same amino acid. Um, and sometimes it doesn't actually matter, depending on how the protein folds. It doesn't matter if one of your amino acids is wrong, it can still make a functional protein. So a lot of mutations occur, they're happening all the time, but very, very few will actually affect your protein that's made. So that's good to know, it's good news. 
Okay, let me just check. Um, it mentions this in reference to enzymes. Um, I talked about structural protein, but it's the exact same for an enzyme. If the protein folds incorrectly, it might make an enzyme, because enzymes are just proteins, that no longer has the right active site. And remember, an active site is just where the substrate will lock into to be broken down. Um, so let's say we're making the amylase enzyme and the active site normally looks like this, but because of a mutation, it folds incorrectly and it looks like this. When the starch comes along, it no longer fits in because it's not folded correctly. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, so that's protein synthesis in short. Let's have a look. Transcription and translation, Oscar. So yeah, that's something that you learn at A-level. I don't think you need to know those words for GCSE. I'm just scanning the specification to double and check. Yeah, they're not even in here. A nice thing you can do is just type in um, command F for find or control F if you're on a normal laptop and you can type in whatever keyword you're looking for. I've just typed in translation and it doesn't come up. So that's A-level. You will learn about translation and transcription if you do A-level biology. What else have we got in the comments? Do we need to know how the A base is changed on the template to a U? I'm not really sure why. No, Ellie, you don't. There's no reference to U um, in the GCSE spec. That's a different base, it's called Uracil. You will learn about that if you do A-level, but for AQA, GCSE, you don't need to know that. Wow, <laughs> Alice, yep, again, that's all A-level. You, I mean, it is A-level, but AQA could give you enough information for you to work out things like substitution and insertion. You don't need to learn that, though. If they're going to ask you something, they will give you all of the information that you need to for it. So if shape of active site changes, enzymes cannot be broken down if the product isn't formed. Well, enzymes aren't broken down themselves. Enzymes will carry out, they'll help speed up the reactor. So in my example, they will take the starch and break it down into glucose. Um, but the, the amylase enzyme, amylase, it's still going to be there at the end. It doesn't get used up or changed during the reaction. Yeah, I think um, a really new specification and everything that exists, what it used to be on, you didn't have biology only. We have covered these bits of combined. Now, I just saw somebody said, could we do classification? No, me. Yes, of course, we can definitely do classification. So let's cover that because that's quite nice and short and sweet. So we have got a big long chain of uh, letters here. And this is how I remember the letters in the right order. In the comments, can you tell me what does E stand for? And a follow-up question, what each letter stands for, can you tell me which two are used for binomial classification of an organism? So what? Does each letter stand for and which two are used for binomial classification? Let's see who gets that first. I'll leave it up here for a second while I have a quick drink of tea. <clears throat> Any answers? There's definitely still a lag. Sorry about that. Sure, Ryan. I'm just asking if you know what each one of these letters stands for in the classification hierarchy. Very good, Ellie. And then Ryan, you finished it off. We've got domain at the top. That's really important. So that's the new level of classification. And that was discovered by a scientist. Do we know his name? So Linnaeus discovered, or rather he came up with all of these, but uh, there's another scientist that came up with the domains. Do you know who came up with it? I'm just gonna fill in the letters. 
Very good. It was Woos or Carl Woos. Okay, so the kind of questions you're going to get here, it's most likely that you'll be given um, in order uh, some organism, maybe like a polar bear or a wolf or a frog, and you will be asked what, what is the class of this wolf, and you have to like know what the order is and then match up what random name you've been given for that. And then very good that the last two are what tell us the binomial classification. So genus and species tell us a species name. The most common one that you've probably heard of is Homo sapiens. That's our binomial name for humans. So it's a two part name. It should be written in italics. First letter is capitalized, second letter is actually meant to be lowercase. So if we were to write this correctly, it would look like this. So, Hader, my way of remembering the letters is with a mnemonic. So I remember definitely keep ponds clean or frogs get sick. So that's my way of remembering the letters but then you also just have to learn the words. I, to be honest, <clears throat> I've taught it enough times that I can just, I don't actually need the mnemonic. It helps if maybe I'm having a weird day, but if you just say the words enough times, you'll get them into your head. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Just say it a few times, write them down a few times. Eventually it will get into your head. Get someone to test you on it as well. Okay, so then we've said that uh, Linnaeus, he came up with all of these, and then Wuss came up with domain, and you need to know the names of the three domains. I think I spotted somebody said it earlier. Yeah, well done, Nomi. Yeah, you've already said them. So we've got the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryota. So those are our three domains. Um, you could be asked what they are. Or you could be given, for example, two and asked to fill in the third. Okay. Um, in relation to uh, prokaryotes, because I sort of thought about this when I first came across this, prokaryotes uh, fit into both archaea and bacteria. They, you get certain species of prokaryotes that fall under both of these. Then eukaryotes are like your animal cells, your fungi, your plant cells, etc. Oh dear, I think I just heard a drill. My neighbors have been doing some DIY, so it might get a bit noisy. Um, Ryan, you said, could you give an example question on the classification system? Yes, yeah, so you could be given, let me look up on Google a nice example of a hierarchy. You could be given, oh, maybe I've not looked up <laughs> a good example for a species. Uh, ooh. Okay, so you could be given these words. Let me write them down. And there's actually a, a lot of different ways that you could get a question on here. So this is just one example. So what I'm doing is I'm writing down, uh, and I'm going to shorten it because it's a very, some long names in here. Okay, so please try and ignore what I've just crossed out because I was trying to squeeze these words in here. So this is the classification hierarchy for a green frog. You would be given it without this information and you could be asked what is the phylum or what phylum does this green frog species belong to? And you would have to work out which phylum it belongs to. And the way you would do that is by writing down your letters and your words alongside the list and then seeing which word matches up against phylum. So can anyone work out what would be the phylum of this green frog? 
which phylum would it belong to? Let's see. Any answers? Which phylum this green frog belongs to? <laughs> I'm going to move my hand and maybe that will help, or maybe there's just still a big lag. Okay, so if we just match them up, the phylum is the third one down, so our phylum is chordata. And you would just have to write that word down as your answer, chordata. So that's how you work it out. Um, and it will be given to you in the right order. They won't be all scrambled up. Another example is you could be given two lists like this side by side. And then you could get a question like, um, something like, which, which levels of hierarchy are shared? And if the first two were the same, they both said eukaryota, then animalia, but then the rest of them were different, and it was which two levels are shared, then you'd have to write down domain and kingdom because they were both the same, but the rest of them were different. So that's another example of a type of question you could get. Okay, is there anything else that you want to go over? We've done all of this so far from combined science and we've done some protein synthesis from biology only. I've just remembered I think that um, Sana you said you wanted to do speciation is that right? Let me know if you're still here Sana and if you do want to do speciation. Uh, everybody else let me know if there's anything else you want to go over. Uh, I'm going to be finishing this at six and um, or earlier if there's nothing else anyone needs help with, um, but that's the cutoff point. So if you've got any topics you want to recap, let me know now or forever hold your peace. Okay, evolution by natural selection is next. Great, so let's cross it off. Okay, so uh, let's flick to evolution now. I actually haven't written a lot of questions on here. Um, <laughs> they kind of grouped together. Uh, I've grouped together these three because they overlap a lot. So first of all, within a population, there's always variation. Variation is just differences between individuals of the same species. Obviously, cats and dogs look different. But when we talk about variation in biology, we're looking within a species. Um, so some cats will have long fur, some will have short fur, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so because of variation, we can have evolution by natural selection. So this is when uh, species evolves. It means their characteristics change over time. And there is um, the theory of natural selection, and you need to memorize this theory. And it says that all living things on this planet evolved from simple life forms three billion years ago. And that definition is on AQA specification. So you need to make sure you learn it and that you have that number, three billion, in your head because that's where we all came from, all living things from the same simple life forms three billion years ago. Okay, but how have we evolved? How has everything actually evolved? Well, natural selection is the process where the organisms with the most favorable characteristics survive, and then they re reproduce passing on those favorable characteristics. So let's say, classic example, giraffes. Let's say, you know, a few thousand, hundred thousand years ago, giraffes lived in a place where there were maybe some lower lying trees, but some disease happened that wiped out those lower lying trees and there were only tall trees left for the giraffes to feed from. The favorable characteristic is going to be the genes that give the, some giraffes a big long neck. And so those giraffes can now reach the tall trees. All of the short neck giraffes would die out because their food source is gone. And the only giraffes left that have survived are the long neck giraffes. So they reproduce and they reproduce passing on the gene for the long neck. And so all of the offspring over time will have that long neck gene 
And so that we say that the species has evolved because now they look different to the previous ones. If they evolve so much that they can no longer uh, breed with the previous species to produce fertile offspring, and fertile just means that they could have their own children. So if they, they breed and they can't make fertile offspring, then they're actually two separate species. They're completely distinct. And that is the process of speciation. So that kind of covers yours too, Sana. Um, speciation, yeah, it's when most often when the populations are isolated and then they both evolve in two different directions. Um, and then if they're brought back together, they can no longer breed to produce fertile offspring. Um, that's speciation. What you could get, Alice, is an example of a question trying to um, identify what has caused the speciation. Um, so, uh, for example, it could be that um, in plants, plants have different times of flowering throughout the year. And maybe one, um, one species of plant evolves to flower during the winter and then it gets isolated and then moves to a different place and it starts to evolve to uh, the flyer and therefore reproduce during summer. If you brought those two populations back together, they're not going to be able to reproduce anymore. So we say that they're separate species. Um, so there's lots of different examples for that. So I think that covers speciation. Let me just try uh, a little bit more detail, historical detail. That is the process of speciation, but you need to know about the scientists that sort of came up with it. So we've mentioned evolution, and for if you're studying biology only, you need to know that at Darwin, he proposed the theory of evolution by natural selection in his book, and it was called On the Origin of Species, um, and that was in 1859. But you also need to know that he had an associate or a colleague um, called Alfred Wallace. Now, Wallace, he was also coming up with the same theory at about the same time, um, and that was separate to each other. They both came up with it themselves. Darwin actually heard about Wallace's work and was a little bit stunned. He was really surprised someone else had come up with the same conclusions as he had, and that's what prompted him to write his book on the origin of a species. Um, but they talked to each other and they actually published some joint writings in 1858, so the year before Darwin published his book. Um, and then Wallace, he went on a sort of separate journey and he did a lot more work on speciation um, and collected a lot of evidence for evolution by natural selection and a lot of work on speciation. Um, over time, the theory of speciation has kind of evolved from what Wallace said. Um, we've got more evidence and we know a little bit more about how it works. Um, but he, he was really the founder of the theory of speciation um, and Darwin as well for evolution by natural selection. So that's the sort of bit of historical information that you need to know. It's written in a specification, so it means that you could be asked about it. Okay, so that is speciation and that's evolution covered as well. Um, the last thing, I mean, I kind of mentioned it when we talked about DNA, is just the fact that um, mutations are what actually cause variation to occur in a population. So remember, those are just changes to DNA. They are occurring all the time, but it's very rare that they actually change the phenotype of an organism. So phenotype is just physically what they look like. Um, but that's pretty rare. Okay, so, uh, that is that covered. You're so welcome, Naomi. Thank you very much for joining me and asking me questions. I'm glad I could help. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. I have got other videos. Maths in biology is my most recent one. It's really important because, yeah, you're going to get a lot of questions because it's 10% of the marks. So make sure you're hot on your math. All right, we've got just under five minutes, and then that's time up. If there's anything, left on the list that you would like to go over, let me know. Uh, I kind of just covered variation there as well. But let me know, we probably have time for one more if anybody else has something burning 
that they want to go over. Oh, I just noticed, Ryan, you said mitosis and meiosis. And Ellie, you've mentioned fossils. Fossils is really short, so to be honest, I can probably fit those both in. Let's try. Okay, so we'll start with meiosis. Uh, I did do a nice diagram for this, so we might as well use it. Um, so you've revised mitosis for paper one, and the good news is, is that meiosis is almost identical up to this point, and then this extra bit is what makes it meiosis instead of mitosis. So your parent cell has got a certain number of chromosomes. In humans, it's 46 or 23 pairs. And in my example, it's two, because that's easier to draw. <laughs> You'll draw. If you get a diagram, it's probably gonna have less as well, because it's just easier. Anyway, so the first step is, is that the genetic material needs to replicate. And so it gets copied, and now we've got four chromosomes. I've just shortened it to chromo so I can fit it in. So four chromosomes are now inside this one cell. Then we go through the first division. And in the first division, the genetic material is split and divided into two cells. So now we're back to having two chromosomes in each cell. That's what happens in mitosis. You could draw a line there, and that's where mitosis would stop. But for meiosis, we need to have a second division. So in our second division, each cell splits into two, one, two. So we end up with four daughter cells and they each have one chromosome. And you'll see that that is half the number as the parent cell. So these cells, they are unique. They are genetically different to each other. If you study A-level, you're gonna learn again, a lot more detail about meiosis and why they're genetically unique. But for now, that's all you need to know. So you've probably, you're probably aware that each egg and sperm cell is different. That's why you as a person are completely unique. There's nobody else in the world like you, unless you've got an identical twin. Um, but these are egg and sperm cells, or well, one or the other, depending on what the parent cell is. So meiosis is for making gametes or sex cells. And that's it, that's meiosis covered. Hope that helps. Yep, Hater, I'm gonna save it. You can access it at the end. And when I get a bit of time, I'll try and put some timestamps on it as well so that you can spot um, the bits that you need to revise and just skip ahead to them. Um, probably tomorrow, I'll get some time. Okay, and finally, Ellie, you wanted to know a little bit about fossils. There's not a lot to know for fossils. You just need to know how they can form. So there's three main ways that they form. Uh, the first is when the conditions for decay are absent. So decay needs warmth and oxygen. If you have a fossil um, preserved in ice, that means decay can happen, or maybe it's preserved inside some amber, which is that stuff that uh, kind of like trees can make then no oxygen can get in. And so bacteria and decomposers, they can't break the living thing down or the dead thing, it's dead now. Um, the second way is when the hard parts, which is basically the skeleton, the cartilage occasionally, those hard parts get replaced by minerals. Um, you might've seen it called mineralization. So when you look at the fossils of um, uh, a dead animal from hundreds, millions of years ago, often it's just, uh, you're not seeing bones, you're seeing the minerals that replace the bones. And then the third way that fossils can be made is when a trace is preserved. So we don't actually need parts of the body as proof that an organism existed. It could be, for example, a footprint. So if we find a footprint that was you know, huge, we might identify it, as a T-Rex footprint, for example. So that can still give us evidence of organisms that lived millions of years ago. So that's the three ways they're formed. They unfortunately don't have a complete fossil record. So human evolution is one of those examples where we can see that there are lots of gaps in the fossil records. And we need to know why there are gaps or why the record is incomplete. So the first thing is that not all organisms will turn into fossils, particularly soft body organisms, they will be decayed. Soft body parts, they don't get replaced by minerals. 
So if you have a worm, worms don't leave fossils. They get completely decayed and broken down and they don't get mineralized. Um, the second reason is that a lot of fossils can be destroyed during geological activity, which basically means the tectonic plates moving around, causing volcanoes and causing big fissures in the earth where fossils are lost and melted. So fossils are lost due to that geological activity. Um, so yeah, we've got an incomplete record, which is why we don't always know exactly um, how fossils, how the fossil record uh, should go. But we can make some guesses and that's what scientists do. Again, if you're interested in fossilization, you should think about studying anthropology. It's really interesting. <laughs> Okay, so that's fossilization, and that's also one hour up. Um, so I'm gonna do another live stream on Friday. Uh, that's for ecology, which is the last topic. This was inheritance, variation, and evolution. So join me on Friday if you wanna go over any parts of ecology. And then I'm gonna do a final live stream um, on Thursday of next week. So that will be the, the day before your exam and your last chance it's just going to be questions and answers, so I'll only go over exactly what you need covered. So, um, thank you very much for joining me. I really hope it's been useful. Um, I'm going to save this so you can watch it back. Um, please subscribe, please give me a thumbs up or comment on the video. All of that helps me get pushed up in YouTube search results, so hopefully more students can learn about this from me. Okay, well, thank you for watching. Thank you. <laughs> um, bye! Good luck revising. I'll see you on Friday, hopefully.